Birleşmiş Milletler Güvenlik Konseyi'nde dünya nüfusunun dörtte birini teşkil eden Müslümanların tek bir daimi temsilcisi var mı? Yok. Geçici üye olmanın bir anlamı var mı? Yok. Karar beş üyeden bir tanesi olumsuz davransa iş bitti. Diyorum ki dünya beşten büyüktür. Artık dünya birinci dünya savaşının şartlarında değildir. Dünyada şartlar değişti. Öyleyse Birleşmiş Milletler'in reforme edilmesi şarttır. Adil bir dünya bekliyorsak bunu beklemek hakkımızdır. Kendisi adaletsizlik üzerine kurulu bir sistemin küresel adalete katkı sağlayabilmesi mümkün değildir. Nitekim bunun sıkıntılarını karşı karşıya olduğumuz birçok sorunda gördük, görüyoruz, yaşıyoruz. Buradan bir kez daha Birleşmiş Milletler Güvenlik Konseyi'nin yapısının dünya nüfusunun coğrafi ve dini dağılımı göz önünde bulundurularak yeniden belirlenmesi çağrımı tekrarlıyorum. İslam ülkeleri içinde yaşanan terör olaylarına ve benzeri krizlere karşı başka güçlerin müdahil olmasını beklemek yerine teröre karşı İslam ittifakı girişimi aracılığıyla çözümü kendimiz üretmeliyiz. Niçin biz Müslümanlar olarak aramızdaki bu tür ihtilaflarda, bu tür terör eylemlerinde başkalarından yardım bekliyoruz? Biz bunu kendimiz çözmeliyiz. Bunlara biz kendimiz müdahale etmeliyiz. Biz etmiyoruz, başkaları müdahale ediyor. Onlar müdahale ederken oralardaki petrol için müdahale ediyorlar. Aramızdaki huzuru sağlamak için değil... Aradan geçen yarım asra yakın zamana rağmen maalesef ne Kudüs kurtarılabilmiştir ne de Filistinliler üzerindeki baskılar hafifletilmiştir. Filistinli kardeşlerimizin İsrail işgali altında her gün yaşamakta oldukları zulüm İslam aleminin bağrında kanayan bir yara olmaya devam ediyor. Harem-i Şerif bir İslam mabedidir. Kendisi hukuk dışı olan işgalin bir de haremi şerife yönelik ihlaller için dayanak yapılmasına izin veremeyiz. Müslümanlar olarak haremi şerifin ve Kudüs'ün muhafazası için daha fazla gayret göstermeliyiz. Filistin'le birlikte tüm bölgede kalıcı barış sağlanmasının yegane yolu bir an önce işgalin sona ermesi ve başkenti Doğu Kudüs olan bağımsız bir Filistin'in kurulmasıdır. Açık konuşuyorum. Akdeniz'de, Ege'de botlarla, kırık dökük gemilerle Avrupa'ya gitmeye çalışanların neredeyse tamamının Müslümanlardan oluşması bizim için bir utanç kaynağıdır. Sayıları milyonlarla ifade edilen bu insanlar güvenlikleri ve gelecekleri için hayatları pahasına böyle bir yolculuğa çıkmaya mecbur kalmışlarsa hep birlikte oturup düşünmek zorundayız. Bizim sadece Ege'de kurtardığımız insan sayısı yüz bine ulaştı. Sahil güvenlik botlarıyla bunları denizden toplayarak kurtardık. Bu bizim İslami, insani ve vicdani görevimiz olduğu için bunu yaptık. Bir zamanlar benzer gerekçelerle Avrupa'dan bizim coğrafyalarımıza, bizim ülkelerimize yaşanan göçün tersine dönmüş olmasının sebeplerini çok iyi analiz etmeliyiz. Şu anda burada bulunan ülkelerin liderler bir aradayız, temsilcileri olarak. Hepimize çok büyük görevler düşüyor. Her zaman ifade ettiğim gibi benim dinim sünnilik de değildir, 
Şiilik de değildir. Benim dinim İslam'dır. Ben tıpkı bir milyar yedi yüz milyon kardeşim gibi sadece ve sadece bir Müslümanım. developments of recent years, Mustafa Kemal's dream of a secular Turkish nation-state is, if not yet dead, then certainly on life support. Recent Turkish governments, but in particular President Erdogan, have changed course towards transforming Turkey into something else. It is not yet clear what the new Turkey will look like, though it is already evident that this is a country that has enormous ambition, which hint at a plan of imperial revival. The Turkey of Atatürk and his Cold War-era successes pursued a relatively unambitious foreign policy. The country stayed out of World War II, was a peripheral member of NATO, and did not become involved in the many conflicts in the Middle East, though there were the perennial crises and even clashes with Greece, culminating in the invasion of Cyprus in 1974. Turkey's nationalist domestic policy and conservative foreign policy was jealously guarded by its military, which was not above launching coups to remove heads of state who were deemed risking Atatürk's legacy. The US looked benevolently at these developments. Under the de facto military rule, Turkey was a stable southern flank of NATO and its inward-looking policies meant the country was unlikely to provoke a crisis that might conceivably unleash World War III. The fact that Turkey actually shared a border with USSR also helped moderate Turkish behavior. All of that changed following the end of the Cold War. The US was no longer interested in internal Turkish politics. Turkey no longer bordered the USSR or even Russia for that matter and the military's grip on Turkey's politics began to slip, allowing the country to recede back into Islamism as evidenced by the very existence and even success of first the Welfare Party, where Erdogan began his political career, and then the Justice and Development Party. Turkish notables such as President Turgut Özal, who proclaimed the 21st century to be Turkey's century, or Prime Minister Suleyman Demiral, who spoke of a Turkish world spanning between the Adriatic Sea and the Great Wall of China, gave voice to Turkish elite's neo-Ottoman ambitions. Turkey began to shift away from ethnic Turkish nationalism as the founding principle and instead embrace Islam as the glue that binds together all the peoples of the state, which has the advantage of potentially greatly expanding Turkey's borders to absorb many of its neighbors. Nowhere was that shift more evident than in Erdogan's calling Kurds Kurds as opposed to Mountain Turks, which was the required term used since Atatürk's times. Until recently, the pan-Turkic agenda has been pursued through largely benign means of applying Turkey's soft power, both through the institution of the Turkic Council, founded in 2009 and comprising Kazakhstan, Turkey, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan, and through bilateral economic, cultural, and political ties which include educational and cultural exchanges, among other measures. Turkey's penetration into Muslim post-Soviet territories is facilitated by the success which Turkish businesses had in establishing themselves on post-Soviet markets. However, America's failures in and destabilization of Iraq and the subsequent Arab Spring revolutions have greatly expanded Turkey's scope of interest, which now includes virtually all of North Africa. Turkey, for example, maintained close relations with Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood and other parts of the Middle East. U.S. apparent withdrawal from the Middle East is creating a vacuum of power and a sea of instability which Turkey is very actively seeking to fill, and it is impatient to do so lest some other power preempted in that task. The rift between Russia and the West caused by the West's regime change policy in Ukraine and subsequent sanctions on Russia likewise signal to Ankara that the situation is ready for Turkish expansion, with a window of opportunity that would likely not stay open for very long. The interest in countries which are not populated by Turkic-speaking peoples suggest the pan-Turkic agenda now has a companion in the form of a neo-Ottoman one, as Turkey is striving to expand its influence in all directions including the Balkans, Caucasus, Central Asia, Middle East proper and North Africa. Moreover, it is now willing to pursue that agenda not only through patient diplomacy and soft power, but by raising proxy armies, such as Daesh, to extend its influence in the relevant regions and even through direct use of military force. Thus, pan osmanism encroaches not only on Iran's and Russia's interests, but also Saudi Arabia's, European Union's, which is interested in Balkan stability, and even Israel's, which would rather prefer to be surrounded by failing Arab states than by a powerful, unified, neo-Ottoman entity. Given these implications, Ankara would have been well advised to pursue a sphere of influence agreements with interested parties ahead of its military actions, which does not appear to be the case considering the division within the ranks of the anti-Assad coalition. It also appears rather contrary to Erdogan's own personality. 
Russia is hardly the only country to have felt betrayed by Erdogan's backflips. Turkey's plans to establish a military base in Qatar cannot possibly be viewed favorably by Saudi Arabia, which almost certainly does not desire to see yet another foreign power in what it considers its own backyard. Even the United States seems concerned by the breadth of Ankara's ambitions, judging by its ordering of Turkey to vacate its positions in northern Iraq and its unwillingness to rush to its NATO's allies' defense in recent weeks following the ambush of the Russian Su-24 near the border with Turkey. Finally, following the refugee crisis which was wholly of Erdogan's making in order to bludgeon the EU into acquiescence in Ankara's Middle East schemes, nobody in that organization will ever believe Erdogan is a reliable partner. Erdogan's erratic policies appear to have had the effect of alarming the EU, in particular so much so that the West, which usually has no trouble in coming up with excuses to impose sanctions on Russia, did not come to Turkey's aid when it found itself on the receiving end of Russia's economic restrictions. However, Turkey's internal political divisions and conflicts meant Erdogan was not able to establish a clear and focused policy of either pan-Turkism or neo-Ottomanism, with the effect of damaging Turkey's international reputation in virtually every politically relevant part of the world and embroiling it in costly conflicts from which it will find it difficult to extricate itself in a face-saving manner. Turkey's predicament is likely why Russia has been so bold in inflicting economic pain on Turkey in retaliation for its stab in the back confident that at the moment, Turkey has almost no friends willing to confront Russia on its behalf. Indeed, US and especially EU actually seem pleased with Russia taking Turkey to task in order to reduce its international adventurism. In the absence of serious rethinking of priorities, Turkey's pan-Turkic and neo-Ottoman ambitions are liable to suffer a major setback, undoing two decades of progress. very closely uh, from the armed forces standpoint. I'm not sure the political ties are as strong as they should be. Well, uh, we have to take a very short break now, but when we come back, Turkey's action may have taken attention away from the fragile political mediation in Syria, but did it manage to undermine it? Well, that's coming up in a moment on Worlds Apart. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Worlds Apart. We are discussing the ever-intensifying Syrian crisis with retired U.S. Army Major General Paul Vallely. Mr. Vallely, you are one of the very few people in the West who not only believe in the existence of the moderate Syrian opposition, but who claim to have seen them and vetted them for the U.S. government. I wonder what crit criteria go into your definition of moderate? Well, that's really not a moderate. What I, what I would say is the... Uh, I've met over a thousand of uh, the civilians, senior uh, ministers, uh, lawyers, doctors, professors, re military that departed the Assad government, I'll say, and formed the basis of what we call for the Free Syrian Army. And uh, they're basically uh, an organization that, that's put, been put together at the ground level in the villages and cities all throughout Syria. But certainly nobody supported them against the Assad. Uh, three or four years ago, and uh, now they've been dissipated a lot, of course, by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and by uh, the, uh, the Syrian Armed Forces. Uh, and at this point in time, uh, there are the remnants there of, uh, I've met over 12 Syrian generals that have uh, left the Assad government and want to see a new Syria, uh, not a tyrannical government that Assad has conducted along with his father prior to that, but Assad has killed so many uh, innocent uh, children and civilians uh, uh, within Syria alone that uh, he'll never be accepted by the majority of Syrians anymore. That's why I recommended to Ambassador Bogdanov that he pass to uh, President Putin, let's solve the situation over there. Let's get a new government. Let's solve the, the problem for all of us over there. But uh, Mr. Vallely, you just mentioned that uh, your belief is that uh, the majority of the Syrian people would never support the uh, Assad government. Why don't we let them decide? Because President Obama, speaking at the, his latest press conference, also had a vision for the political transition in, in, in Syria, he mentioned the constitution, he mentioned the elections, and then he said, then we can look into Assad choosing not to run. Why can't we leave that choice to the Syrian people? Well, the Syrian people and population, uh, as you well know, are so fragmented today. The millions that have gone into Jordan and Turkey and now flooding into Europe, and many of the villages and cities 
uh, in uh, eastern Syria have all been vacated. You have the Alawites uh, under uh, Assad uh, uh, controlling Damascus and areas uh, in the uh, western uh, Syria territory that borders on the Mediterranean and Turkey. So with a fractured state like that, how do you get them to unify unless you can have some kind of a ceasefire against the innocent civilians and people over there and do that secure zone uh, all along the Mediterranean there for the Syrians to come back. Now you can start unifying the country. But you've, and then focus, as I said, your efforts uh, uh, against ISIS and destroying ISIS. So that's the way to do it. But in order to get the people to decide uh, they have to be brought together in some kind of a forum. What, uh, That's why you Mr. have to accept Bellely, some of the Mr. opposition Bellely, with, groups. With all due respect, I mean, yes. you can organize uh, elections in consulates, in uh, refugee camps, wherever. I mean, when Russians and Americans met in Vienna last time, they sure. agreed that Syrians abroad should be able to take part in the elections, but it does not necessarily mean that Americans, Russians, or Turks, for that matter, should come in and say that, you know, the precondition for all of that to happen is Assad has to go. Well, this isn't me. I'm talking to some of the senior Syrians that I have met with, and they will not accept a continual tyrannical government under Assad. It's just not going to happen. So uh, the best thing is get them a Dachau outside of Moscow or on the Black Sea, have them uh, just move out, put an interim government in, and then they can form a new constitution, and then they can unify the Syrian people as they come back into the country. So there's a series of events, a series of options that can be taken by smart people with common sense. But we've got to stop and have a ceasefire of some kind. Absolutely. Well, on the ceasefire, I totally agree with you. But yes. let's, let's view your proposition uh, as a matter of military strategy rather than a political issue. Uh, you know, everybody agrees on the need to have some sort of um, um, ground force to complement airstrikes. And uh, you say you spend time with the opposition. I spend a lot of time with the Syrian army. I know how devoted Syrian soldiers are to President Assad. Personally, they have his pictures as screensavers on their phones. So if your proposal is realized, if Assad packs up and goes tomorrow, what do you think will happen to those thousands and thousands of young Syrian soldiers? Won't they feel betrayed? Won't they do the same? And if that happens, who will be left to fight against ISIS? Well, no, I, I think the young people over there and the ones I met in Vienna not too long ago, uh, that I've also met in Turkey, uh, a number of them, uh, again, not all military, but uh, they were members of government. Uh, they would uh, unify, and I think the younger people within the Assad Armed Forces or the Syrian Armed Forces would like to look to a future of freedom and look to a future of economic development. I think they would all go for that. But it's a package that uh, has got to be proposed and abided by. And I think all of them in some way would look to a, a new United Syria as the best course of action for the Syrian people. But you have to sell that. You have to have a proposal. You have to have a strategy. And you've got to be able to bring those leaders in that are affecting uh, not only the internal uh, situation in Syria, but...